Kurt Vonnegut's works has evoked ire and controversy on several occasions. His most prominent novel, the main subject of this episode, has been objected to or removed at various institutions on no less than 18 instances. It has been called anti-American, anti-Christian, anti-Semitic, and just plain filthy. This novel is also the first of his to become an immediate bestseller, landing it on the top of the New York Times bestseller list. The semi-autobiographical science fiction time travel anti-war novel was and is still read in schools and universities around the world and has helped solidify Vonnegut's legacy. Welcome to House of Words, a podcast about writers, the time traveling, and brave. I'm your host, Jason Nemore Hardin, and on this episode, we're set to explore the very fascinating figure that was Kurt Vonnegut and one of his masterpieces, Slaughterhouse-Five. Quote, if you want to really hurt your parents and you don't have the nerve to be gay, the least you can do is go into the arts. I'm not kidding. The arts are not a way to make a living. They are a very human way of making life more bearable. Practicing an art, no matter how well or badly, is a way to make your soul grow, for heaven's sake. Sing in the shower, dance to the radio, tell stories, write a poem to a friend, even a lousy poem. Do it as well as you possibly can. You will get an enormous reward. You will have created something. End quote. Kurt Vonnegut Jr. was born in Indianapolis, Indiana on November 11, 1922, as the youngest of three children. Both his parents were fluent in German, but the ill feeling toward Germany during and after World War I led them to abandon German culture and adopt American patriotism instead. Because of this, they did not teach young Kurt to speak German or even introduce him to German literature and traditions, leaving him feeling, as he would later say, ignorant and rootless. Despite this, he would refer to his childhood as a fortunate one, describing his parents as gentle, cultivated people who taught him reverence toward all sorts of life. He was close with his brother and sister. They would play together constantly, inventing games and riddles and even a private language. Kurt would also credit Ida Young, his family's African-American cook and housekeeper during the first decade of his life, for raising him and instilling in him values of decent moral instruction that he would take on with him for the rest of his life. He remembers always being nuts about writing and would keep a diary as a little boy. The minor detail that he had nothing to write about wasn't something he allowed to keep him from filling page after page with writing. When asked about what compelled him to write, he would say that George Orwell had said it best. People write the books they can't find on library shelves. Unfortunately, the financial security and social prosperity that the Vonnegut family had once enjoyed were destroyed when the Great Depression hit. The Great Depression made it so that few people could afford to build, causing the clients at Vonnegut Sr.'s architectural firm to diminish at an alarming speed. Kurt's brother and sister had finished their primary and secondary educations in private schools by this point, but young Kurt would be placed in a public school called Public School No. 43, now the James Whitcomb Riley School. In order to deal with the turmoil of the times, his father withdrew from normal life and became what Kurt called a dreamy artist. His mother became depressed, withdrawn, bitter, and abusive. She labored to regain the family's wealth and status, and as Kurt said, she expressed hatred for her husband that was as corrosive as hydrochloric acid. Being a writer in her own right, his mother tried to sell short stories she had written to Collier's, the Saturday Evening Post, and other magazines during this time. To no success, unfortunately. Kurt enrolled at Short Ridge High School in Indianapolis in 1936. While there, he played clarinet in the school band and became a co-editor for the Tuesday edition of the school newspaper, The Short Ridge Echo. 
He would later say that his tenure with the Echo allowed him to write for a large audience rather than for a teacher, an experience he found to be fun and easy. He would say, Each person has something he can do easily and can't imagine why everybody else has so much trouble doing it. For him, this was writing. After graduating from Shortridge in 1940, he enrolled at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. He overcame stiff competition for a place at the university's independent newspaper, the Cornell Daily Sun, first serving as a staff writer, then as an editor. By the end of his first year, he was writing a column titled Innocence Abroad, which reused jokes from other publications. He later penned a piece, Well All Right, focusing on pacifism, a cause he strongly supported arguing against U.S. intervention in World War II. When the attack on Pearl Harbor brought the U.S. into the war, he was a member of the Reserve Officers Training Corps, but soon thereafter, poor grades and a particular article in Cornell's newspaper cost him his place there. He was placed on academic probation in May of 1942 and dropped out on January 1943. No longer eligible for deferment as a member of Reserve Officers Training Corps, he faced a draft into the United States Army. Instead of waiting, he enlisted in March of 1943. More than a year and a half later, on December 22, 1944, he was captured with about 50 other American soldiers. He was taken by boxcar to a prison camp south of Dresden in Saxony. During the journey, which would become a large part of Slaughterhouse-Five, the Royal Air Force mistakenly attacked the trains carrying he and his fellow prisoners of war, killing about 150 of them. He survived and was sent to Dresden, the first fancy city he had ever seen. He lived in a slaughterhouse when he got to the city and worked in a factory that made malt syrup for pregnant women. He recalled the sirens going off whenever another city was bombed. The Germans, according to him, did not expect Dresden to be bombed. He would later state, There were very few air raid shelters in town and no war industries just cigarette factories, hospitals, clarinet factories. On February 13, 1945, Dresden became the target of Allied forces. In the hours and days that followed, the Allies engaged in a fierce firebombing of the city. On February 15, with around 25,000 civilians killed in the bombing, the attacks finally subsided. He marveled at the level of both the destruction in Dresden and the secrecy that surrounded it. He had survived by taking refuge in a meat locker three stories underground. It was cool there with cadavers hanging all around, he said. When we came up, the city was gone. They burnt the whole damn town down. After the bombing, he and other American prisoners were put to work immediately excavating bodies from the rubble. He described the activity as a terribly elaborate Easter egg hunt. With the captives abandoned by their guards, he reached a prisoner-of-war repatriation camp in Le Havre, France, before the end of May 1945. He returned to the United States and continued to serve in the Army, stationed at Fort Riley, Kansas, typing discharge papers for other soldiers. Soon after, he was awarded a Purple Heart, about which he remarked jokingly, I myself was awarded my country's second lowest decoration, a Purple Heart. For frostbite. After being discharged, now 22 years old, he married Jane Marie Cox, his high school girlfriend and classmate since kindergarten on September 1, 1945. The pair relocated to Chicago where he enrolled in the University of Chicago on the GI Bill as an anthropology student in an unusual five-year joint undergraduate graduate program that conferred a master's degree. Always thinking outside the box when it came to writing, he would leave the university without any degree, despite having completed his undergraduate education when his master's thesis on the ghost dance religious movement was unanimously rejected by the department. Shortly thereafter, General Electric hired him as a technical writer, then publicist in Schenectady, New York. Although his work required a college degree, he was hired after claiming to hold a master's degree in anthropology from the University of Chicago. Then, in 1949, Kurt and Jane had a daughter named Edith. Still working for GE, 
He had his first piece titled Report on the Barn House Effect, published in the February 11, 1950 issue of Collier's, for which he received $750. He then wrote another story after being coached by the fiction editor at Collier's and again sold it to the magazine, this time for $950. While the editor supported Kurt's writing, he was shocked when Kurt quit GE as of January 1st, 1951, later stating, I never said he should give up his job and devote himself to fiction. I don't trust the freelancer's life. It's tough. Nevertheless, in early 1951, Kurt moved with his family to Cape Cod, Massachusetts to write full time, leaving his old life behind. Already by August 1952, Kurt Vonnegut's first novel, Player Piano, was published by Scribner's. In Player Piano, he originates many of the techniques he would use in his later works, among these early examples of the use of metafiction as well as a dark sense of humor. Though the book was well received and was nominated for the International Fantasy Award in 1953, he wasn't making much money and would write and sell short stories for various magazines in order to make ends meet. Contracted to produce a second novel, which eventually became Cat's Cradle, he struggled to complete it and the work would drag on for years. With a growing family and no financially successful novels as of yet, the short stories he wrote helped to sustain the family, though he frequently needed to find additional sources of income as well. In 1957, he and a partner opened a Saab automobile dealership on Cape Cod, but it went bankrupt by the end of the year. The hard times would not ease up any time soon, as 1958 became a year of tragedy. His sister Alice had lived with cancer for a while, and although her death was expected, it was a crushing one. He had once said that the way to achieve artistic wholeness was to create for one person in mind. For him, this was his sister. The plan had been that when she died, her husband would take care of their four sons. As fate would have it, however, while on commute by train to Manhattan, he was trapped in one of the cars when his train went over an open drawbridge and he drowned. Tragically, his death was two days before that of Alice. So it goes. Kurt and his family would then take custody of their four sons and keep his word to Alice, which was to keep the boys together. Grappling with family challenges, they now had seven children. He continued to write publishing novels vastly dissimilar in terms of plot. The Sirens of Titan in 1959 features a Martian invasion of Earth as experienced by a bored billionaire. Mother Knight, published in 1961, the fictional memoirs of Howard W. Campbell, Jr., an American who moved to Germany in 1923 at age 11 and later became a well-known playwright and Nazi propagandist, received little attention at the time of its publication. Also published in 1961 was Vonnegut's short story, Harrison Bergeron, set in a dystopian future where all are equal, even if that means disfiguring beautiful people and forcing the strong or intelligent to wear devices that negate their advantages. Cat's Cradle was finally published in 1963, a decade after he began it, and he was hailed for writing a near-perfect novel for the first time in his career. Despite this, in the mid-1960s, he contemplated abandoning his writing career. In 1999, he wrote in the New York Times, I had gone broke, was out of print, and had a lot of kids. These were very stressful times, and his family would suffer his drastic mood swings on a daily basis. His children would later tell that the mood for the rest of the day was very much dictated by how well his morning writing had gone. If he'd had a good writing session, he'd play and dance with them, but... If it had been a not-so-good session, they would do best to stay clear of him for the rest of the day. Although on the verge of giving up, on the recommendation of an admirer, he received a surprise offer of a teaching job at the Iowa Writers Workshop. He likened the employment to the rescue of a drowning man. Quote, Beware of the man who works hard to learn something, learns it, and finds himself no wiser than before. 
end quote. Slaughterhouse-Five, or The Children's Crusade, A Duty Dance with Death, Vonnegut's semi-autobiographic science fiction anti-war novel began decades before it was published. He had been writing about his war experiences at Dresden ever since he returned from the war, but had never been able to write anything acceptable to himself or his publishers, which the first chapter of the novel also tells about. It was the novel he saw himself working up towards for years. He'd tell people who asked that he was working on his Dresden novel, pushing himself, hoping that something would break loose and he'd be able to do what he was telling people. As stated in the first chapter of the novel, he expected it would be easy to write about his experience during the Second World War. He would simply sit down and remember and then report what he had seen. He also expected it to be a masterpiece, or at least make him a lot of money. The latter two points would prove true. The former, however, would be much more difficult than anticipated. After spending almost two years at the writer's workshop at the University of Iowa, teaching one course each term, Kurt was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship for Research in Germany. By the time he won it, in March 1967, he was becoming a well-known writer and used the funds to travel in Eastern Europe, including to Dresden, where he found many prominent buildings still in ruins. At the time of the bombing during World War II, he hadn't appreciated the sheer scale of destruction. His understanding of this arrived slowly as information dribbled out. Many questions, however, as mentioned in the novel, would remain unanswered. Discarded drafts show the difficulty and struggle he had agreeing with himself about how the story should be told. He tried writing in the first person. He tried writing in his own point of view. He tried writing it under a made-up name. Some drafts were written in the form of being told by someone who was already dead. The title of the book changed several times, being called Captured, Magic Fingers, Boiling Piss Pots, and Flaming Prams at different times. At one point, he gives up trying to write the story as a novel altogether and instead attempts to write it as a play. Now, given that he didn't have the modern cut-and-paste method at his disposal, one has to marvel at the fact that he wrote all these drafts and variations on his typewriter. Laboriously, he would sometimes get halfway into the novel before coming to the conclusion that it wasn't working and would start all over again. It seems that to clear his head between frustrations, he would doodle and draw on the pages, some of which were included in the novel. But one thing is clear, he refused to give up. In addition to being a classic novel, Slaughterhouse-Five is truly a monument of his perseverance. Released in 1969, the novel tells of the life of Billy Pilgrim, who, like Vonnegut, was born in 1922 and survives the bombing of Dresden, though not without being left with deep scars from his time during battle. The narrator introduces the novel's origin by telling of his connection to the Dresden bombing and why he is recording it. He provides a description of himself and of the book, saying that it is a desperate attempt at creating a scholarly work. He ends the first chapter by discussing the beginning and the end of the novel. Now, the story is told in a linear fashion, with many of the story's climaxes, Billy's death in 1976, his kidnapping by aliens from the planet of Tralfamador nine years earlier, and the execution of Billy's friend Edgar Derby in the ashes of Dresden for stealing a teapot, disclosed in the story's first pages. This is something that he would later use as advice to aspiring writers, saying, Give your readers as much information as possible, as soon as possible. To heck with suspense. Readers should have such complete understanding of what is going on, where, and why, that they could finish the story themselves, should cockroaches eat the last few pages. In keeping with his signature style, the novel's syntax and sentence structure are simple, and irony, sentimentality, black humor, and didacticism are prevalent throughout the novel. Like much of his oeuvre, Slaughterhouse-Five is broken into small pieces, and in this case, into brief experiences, each focused on a specific point in time. 
He has noted that his books are essentially mosaics made up of a whole bunch of tiny little chips, and each chip is a joke. Characteristically, Kurt makes heavy use of repetition, frequently using the phrase, so it goes. He uses it as a refrain when events of death, dying, and mortality occur or are mentioned, as a narrative transition to another subject, as a memento mori, as comic relief, and to explain the unexplained. The phrase appears 106 times throughout the novel. The first sentence, which reads, All this happened, more or less, was in 2010 ranked number 38 on the American Book Review's list of 100 best first lines from novels. The opening sentences of the novel have been said to contain the aesthetic method statement of the entire novel. Slaughterhouse-Five received generally positive reviews and catapulted Kurt Vonnegut into celebrity life. His earlier works had appealed strongly to many college students, and the anti-war message of Slaughterhouse-Five resonated with a generation marked by the Vietnam War. He later stated that the loss of confidence in government that Vietnam caused finally allowed an honest conversation regarding events like Dresden. In a 1969 interview, he described his routine as follows. I get up at 7.30 and work for four hours a day, 9 to 12 in the morning, 5 to 6 in the evening. Businessmen would achieve better results if they studied human metabolism. No one works well eight hours a day. No one ought to work more than four hours. On a later date, he would go into a more detailed explanation saying, in an unmoored life like mine, sleep and hunger and work arrange themselves to suit themselves without consulting me. I'm just as glad they haven't consulted me about the tiresome details. What they have worked out is this. I awake at 5.30, work until 8, eat breakfast at home, work until 10, walk a few blocks into town, do errands, go to the nearby municipal swimming pool, which I have all to myself, and swim half an hour return home at 11.45, read the mail, eat lunch at noon. In the afternoon, I do schoolwork, either teach or prepare. When I get home from school at about 5.30, I numb my twanging intellect with several belts of scotch and water, $5 per fifth at the state liquor store, the only liquor store in town. There are loads of bars, though. Cook supper, read, and listen to jazz. Lots of good music on the radio here. Slip off to sleep at 10.00. I do push-ups and sit-ups all the time and feel as though I am getting lean and sinewy, but maybe not. Quote, people aren't supposed to look back. I'm certainly not going to do it anymore. End quote. After Slaughterhouse-Five was published, Kurt Vonnegut embraced the fame and financial security that attended its release. He was hailed as a hero of the burgeoning anti-war movement in the United States. Additionally, he was invited to speak at numerous rallies and gave college commencement addresses around the country. In 1972, Universal Pictures adapted Slaughterhouse-Five into a film which the author said was flawless. In subsequent years, his popularity resurged as he published several satirical books, including Jailbird, 1979, Dead Eye Dick, 1982, Galapagos, 1985, Bluebeard, 1987, and Hocus Pocus, 1990. Although he remained a prolific writer in the 1980s, he struggled with depression and attempted suicide in 1984. Two years later, he was seen by a younger generation when he played himself in Rodney Dangerfield's film, Back to School. The last of his 14 novels, Time Quake, published in 1997, was as University of Detroit history professor and Vonnegut biographer George Sumner said, a reflection of an aging man facing mortality and testimony to an embattled faith in the resilience of human awareness and agency. His final book, a collection of essays entitled A Man Without a Country, published in 2005, also became a bestseller. In a 2006 Rolling Stone interview, he sardonically stated that he would sue the Brown and Williamson Tobacco Company, the maker of the Paul Mall branded cigarettes he had been smoking since he was around 12 or 14 years old, for falsely advertising, saying, And do you know why? 
because I'm 83 years old. The lying bastards on the package Brown and Williamson promised to kill me. Kurt Vonnegut died in the Manhattan borough of New York City on the night of April 11, 2007, as a result of brain injuries occurred several weeks prior from a fall at his brownstone home. He was 84 years old. At the time of his death, he had written 14 novels, three short story collections, five plays, and five nonfiction books, and left behind a legacy to be reckoned with. Let me leave you with a final quote from the unparalleled writer. Still and all, why bother? Here's my answer. Many people need desperately to receive this message. I feel and think as much as you do, care about many of the things you care about, although most people do not care about them. You are not alone. End quote. Thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this episode and will spread the word about the podcast. Once again, I have been your host, Jason and Moore Harden. We here at House of Words ask that you please consider helping to make this show easier to produce and more frequent by contributing on our Patreon page at patreon.com slash houseofwords or paypal.me slash houseofwordspodcast. Alternatively, you can subscribe and encourage others to subscribe to our YouTube page, House of Words Podcast. Every little bit helps more than you might think. Until next time, keep turning those pages. House of Words is written and produced by Crystal M. Sanchez. Narrated and written by me, Jason and Moore Harden. And music by Creature Nine and Wood. All rights and ownership belong to Crystal M. Sanchez and Jason and Moore Harden. <laughs> <laughs>